Hello guys, welcome back to my channel, or if you're new, welcome. My name is Monica, and today it is gross outside. We are under quarantine, and I, I don't know. I feel like it'd be a good day to just do like a nice long tag video. So this is called the Beauty Brand Tag, and I originally saw this on Angelica Neekvist's channel, and the creator of this tag is Tara Brooks. So I will have both of their videos and both of their channels linked down below. This is a nice long tag. We have 15 questions and they are, they're like deep, like questions that really make you think and they might have long answers. So I thought it'd be great just to like get comfy. You can speed this video up if you like. I like speeding most videos that I watch now up to like 1.5 speed. So feel free to do that if not two times speed and just listen to my thoughts on all of these makeup brands, which <laughs> This could bleed into a Bochinche chat. I thought about doing a Bochinche chat on this, but I really want to do another live stream, maybe, I don't know, sometime during this quarantine. But I do know that YouTube is suppressing live streams. So even if I did one, I didn't know if it would pop up. So this is kind of in place of the Bochinche chat that I would kind of like to do on brands. But I still want to do Bochinche chats in the future, especially during this time of social distancing. So this tag has 15 long questions. I have it up on my phone, so let's just jump right in. Oh, wait, I lied. First, uh, I do have a full playlist of all of my makeup tag videos that I've ever done. I'll throw that up in the cards. And I also did create my own tag, which is called the part-time YouTuber tag. I still see people doing this tag now and it just warms my heart and I'm so happy. And I have a whole playlist of everyone who's done that I've seen who's done the part-time YouTuber tag. So I also have that up in the cards. And please, if anyone else has done this tag that I have not been able to find or I've not seen, please let me know so I can also add them to my master playlist. Okay, so this first question is, Think back to when you first started your makeup collection. Are there any brands you used then that you still use today? When I first started makeup, I remember, I think I still have pictures. I'll throw them up if I can. I had a really tiny little vanity in a very small collection because I, I really couldn't afford much. Back then, I was working my first full-time job after school and 95% of what I was making was going towards my student loans. And I still live, I've lived with family then, I still live with family now, so thankfully I don't have to worry about that, uh, like with rent or other like really big expenses. Everything that I've kind of made has gone towards student loans. <laughs> That's another story for another day. But back then I didn't really have much to spend on makeup. But thinking back to what I bought back then, uh, a for, some of the first few things I ever bought for myself were higher end drugstore, some drugstore, and... Uh, I remember specifically I had Too Faced products. My first like nice eyeshadow palettes were from Too Faced. Uh, I'm not really purchasing anything from Too Faced recently, but I still have a few favorites from the brand, including the Sweet Peach palette. And let's think. So I had Too Faced definitely. I remember Physicians Formula because I used to watch and love the like drugstore makeup starter kit videos that were big back then. And Physicians Formula was always huge. I know they have a big shade range problem when it comes to their foundations and concealers, but I know their bronzers, they now have a bigger shade range for their bronzers. And uh, I know they do have eyeshadows. I have the I have the whole big butter box now for the butter collection. I think the butter collection is really well done, but I think they still have a lot of work to do when it comes to like their foundations and concealers or any other like base products like that. But I remember having early the butter bronzer and the shimmer brick and I still have those products and I still do buy from Physicians Formula so I think those are probably the two main brands that I had at the very beginning like some of my first makeup products that are still kind of around today. Next question is follow-up which brands have you moved on from? Now I remember something that I bought a lot back then that I really have not really gone back to to, like at all was the Sephora collection so like the the Sephora brand version of their makeup I remember they had a BB cream that I loved and I used constantly they had a face powder I think they sell the face powder but I know the BB or CC cream that I loved has been discontinued that's no longer available um, I remember I had their face powder I had their brushes and I've noticed recently that their own brand not only are the prices creeping up but their brushes I don't honestly I can't really speak to them but if they're the same quality as the brushes I had before they're not worth this price increase but I haven't tried them so I don't know if I want to go back in and retry the newer Sephora brushes to see if they're actually worth the price but I've just like looking at like new releases of the brushes now they're like expensive 
shockingly so. So I do think the Sephora collection is probably like the one brand that I used heavily in my early years when I really couldn't afford much that I've kind of moved on from. Question number three is, are there any brands you thought were so expensive that you'd never buy anything from them, but now consider at least one of their products to be a holy grail? I, so back at the beginning, I never thought I would buy anything luxury, like one of the designer house brands, Dior or uh, YSL. I never thought I would get anything Natasha Denona ever. Now thinking about products that are holy grails, I think the Natasha Denona loose powder was incredible. I have other loose powder favorites that are like a third, if not an eighth of the price of that powder. So I've never consciously wanted to like go back and rebuy it, but I've had to hold myself back because that the Natasha Denona, that loose powder was incredible. <laughs> like the Pat McGrath powder that I was generously gifted through Influencer, that powder is also incredible. So I think those like really, really finely milled loose powders from these like more designer higher end brands are really worth it. Like a good staple base product like that that works for you. Oh. Mm. And I also I find myself really also liking the Pat McGrath concealer and certain Natasha Denona shadows. But yeah, at the beginning, I when I was struggling to afford a Physician's Formula product at CVS, I never could have imagined that I would have actually have not only a collection of this size, but such beautiful and luxurious products. Question number four is, what is a popular brand that you've never tried and don't think you ever will? That's a really good question. I'm trying to think, what have I never tried? I've tried a lot of stuff now. Hmm. What have I have never tried? I think Makeup Forever. If anything, I've tried maybe like a primer or something, but I've never really tried their shadows, their face products or anything. And back when I first got into makeup, Makeup Forever was like the brand. Like everyone loved their shadows. They would make their own palettes. They would have their, oh, I've tried their foundation a long time ago. So does that really count? Mm, I don't think so. Let me look. I'm gonna go into the Sephora app and literally pull up like a list of brands to see if I've never tried any of these. Oh, Bare Minerals. I think that's one. I've never really tried anything from Bare Minerals that wasn't a sample. I've never bought a full size Bare Mineral product. People are really like on the fence about this brand. They really don't like, they're really split about whether they're like amazing and they really work for their skin and they help or if they're just overpriced like garbage. So because of that, and I've never really been interested in it, uh, the vibe that they, uh, like, put forth isn't really what I'm interested in in makeup, or at least when it comes to makeup, so I've never tried them, and I really don't think I ever will, just because when I do makeup, makeup's like my happy time, my fun place, my me time, especially now during this quarantine time, so when I'm doing makeup, I want something kind of more full glam. I'm not really looking for the no makeup makeup, at least not as often as I would need to be in order to justify purchasing those products. Sometimes I go for no makeup makeup, but 95% of the time I, I, I like makeup. I want it to be there. I want to go bam and like have a nice look. So Bare Minerals has never really been on my radar. Question number five is what brand perfectly encapsulates your current makeup aesthetic? I, I love Lunatic Cosmetic Labs. They are an indie brand and they're a bit pricey, but I love the entire aesthetic. Uh, and I feel like it's like me to a T. Well, actually, I did a video a while ago. I forgot what it, I, I gotta look it up and put it here and like link it. But I talked about how like my perfect brand would be a mix between Besame Cosmetics and Lunatic Cosmetic Labs. That would be me. So, I, I mean, I love Lunatic Cosmetic Labs. I love their palettes. I've tried out their contour palette that I love. I've tried out some eyeshadows that I also love. And I want to buy more from that brand. So I feel like recently, honestly, I haven't really been buying anything ever since <laughs> this quarantine started. But uh, once I do start purchasing again, I really do want to buy more from that brand, especially because they did come out with a new, like, 
nude kind of palette. I really want to try that. I want to get their heart palette. I hope that's not limited edition. Uh, they came out with one for Valentine's Day. So I love that brand. It's, it's so just perfect. And also whenever they ship you your order, it comes in a cardboard box that's shaped like a headstone. And it says, here lies your face. I literally kept that box. I still have the box that I placed that order in because I love it. I wear all black. I like glam looks. I have black hair. I like red lipstick. This brand is just mwah, mwah. Hello, so update on this. I actually recently, so April 1st, Lunatic Cosmetic Labs had a sale on their website. And so it's like the first thing I've ever actually bought since the beginning of like this quarantine time. I purchased their new nude palette and I also purchased their heart palette. So I have both of those on the way right now. I honestly have no idea when they're gonna get here, but I definitely want to do a video once they come in. So I'm looking forward to that. Also, I'm standing in front of a window right now because I miss the outside. Question number six is, are there brands you haven't wanted to try purely because you don't like their packaging? You know, I don't know. Uh, I feel like there are a few products that, because of their bad packaging, really turned me off of the product as a whole, uh, including the Fenty powder. The Fenty loose powder has, like, the world's worst packaging for loose powder at all. But I, I, don't, I don't think that I've written off a whole brand because of their packaging. Have you guys? Let me know down below. Question number seven is, is there a brand you've only tried because their packaging lured you in? Well, let's uh, take a time machine and go back to when I first walked into a Sephora for the very first time. I walked through a Sephora, a little baby Monica in college, not knowing anything about makeup. And the one display that pulled me in was Too Faced. I don't know what it was. The boudoir eyes eyeshadow palette was just like calling my name. And I think it's because it's like soft, but smoky, but sexy. And that's kind of what I'm aiming for. So that brand definitely pulled me in because of their packaging, because of their aesthetic. Uh, their owner is still pulling some shit. And so that's kind of the main reason why I'm taking a step back from Too Faced. But I have to admit their packaging, their aesthetic. Sometimes it goes a bit too far, like that whole collection with that real housewife. They get a little bit inappropriate because they're, they're kind of teetering the line between like, um, like childish kind of makeup and like way too explicit makeup. But when they find that nice middle ground, that is kind of, it reminds me of the movie, um, Christina Aguilera and Cher were in. Uh, mmm burlesque i think that's what it's called but if they teeter that line like with the boudoir eyes palette like that's their sweet spot they shouldn't go too kitty like with the too cute palette but they also shouldn't go too explicit like with that collection if they find their sweet spot that's like their strength that's great question number eight says some would say drugstore and mid-range prices are starting to overlap what drugstore beauty brands are guilty of making this happen and what are your thoughts on rising drugstore makeup prices Oh, 100%. Even in just my time, which I would say is since 2014, 2015, I've seen prices jump in the drugstore. I'm not really happy with this because the whole point of drugstore makeup is to get something quality at a lower price. If you are still sold in drugstores, but your prices are creeping up to what I can see in Sephora, I'm not going to buy your product. I'm going to go to Sephora. Brands that I think are guilty of pushing the prices up physician's formula i've seen products though from like maybelline their new um maybelline covergirl they have liquid shadows that are they're creeping up there so like the stila glitter and glows are 24 dollars. the drugstore equivalents that are still pretty good products i have to admit i like them but they're in the teens they're like 15 dollars 14 15 dollars so they're creeping up there but like, I, I really wonder, are these companies really making from these price increases the money that they want to see? Or are people really jumping ship and going for brands that are still staying affordable, like Elf and Wet n Wild? Because like, if I'm given the choice, would I choose a brand that is overpriced at the drugstore? Or would I choose something more affordable or something at Sephora? Because for me, if I'm looking for affordable, I want something like under $15. 
Otherwise, I'm going to walk my ass into a Sephora or an Ulta and find something that's luxury like I want. The brands that are like really toe on the line, I don't think they're going to keep doing well. I mean, I mean, honestly, you've got huge powerhouses like Maybelline and CoverGirl. But like, you know, like, I don't know. I know from a marketing standpoint, from a business standpoint, it does, it does, it does them well to increase prices year after year. But I don't really want to support those companies when it comes to drugstore products. The whole reason I'm going to the drugstore for makeup is because I want something that's quality but still affordable. Just saying. Question number nine is, with an anti-consumerist mentality starting to take hold in the YouTube beauty space, are there any brands you still feel a loyalty towards? Simply put, can you be anti-consumerist and have brand loyalty at the same time? I think that's difficult, especially when you're in a society or a country that is super capitalist. I'm So I'm in the United States. We have a hyper-capitalist society here. I really don't think, I mean, from my personal standpoint, I'm not anti-consumerist at all. I still like products. I like buying products. I like having products. I've never advertised myself as being anti-consumerist. I've tried to make myself a bit more tailored. Like, I, I still want to purchase things. I still want to buy things, but I'm trying to tailor them to who I am, what I want, and what is within my actual reach. I never would promote anyone going into debt for makeup, anyone going into debt for anything other than like uh, home ownership, student loans, which uh, that could be a whole nother video again. But I don't really want to advocate this hyper materialistic lifestyle, but I'm also not a minimalist. I find myself, I feel like most people in the middle. So what was the question again? <laughs> Do you, can you still be anti-consumerist and be loyal to a brand? That's for anyone to decide. Because everyone can decide what minimalism, what consumerism means to them. And their brand loyalties can stay within that. I do think it is a bit dangerous to be super loyal to a brand when you really don't know a lot about like the owner or like what the brand practices are. So I really do want to advocate that we should just be aware. I'm not going to push my viewpoint and why I do or do not support brands on anyone else. I will let you know. But I'm not going to like judge anyone or like make them feel bad for their choices. As long as you are informed and making your choices and you can just and you can like explain why or why not you support brands or products or people, the more power to you. Everyone is allowed their opinion everyone is allowed to have their own viewpoints. But if you're making them out of ignorance and just because it's what everyone else is doing and you can't explain why, that's not good. You have to actually have put thought behind it for me to like respect it. And I'm just gonna put it there. Question number 10 is, have you ever felt betrayed by a brand? If so, what happened? Now, I don't think uh, I would describe anything that I've seen as being betrayed. I've been disappointed in brands heavily. <laughs> I know back when Tarte did their original uh, Shape Tape foundation range and all the shit that happened there, I was disappointed. I was disappointed when Beauty Blender pulled the same shit. I was disappointed when the owner of Too Faced Sister did all this shit. I've been disappointed across the board, but I've never felt like betrayed because I don't see brands as my friends. <laughs> And I feel like in this new age of uh, influencers like Norvina coming out and being the relatable millennial in charge of ABH, if anything, ABH, like, prestige and everything has just gone downhill because of her influence, because of the fact that products are being pushed out every week, because of who she's aligning herself with because now Norvina isn't just like a rich spoiled kid who grew up under someone who was very successful. She's not the face of a brand and everything that she does reflects on the brand. So because she was supporting a racist by sending them a really expensive gift, now people can say, oh, so ABH supports racists. So I, uh, yeah. So I like to take a step back. I don't think of anyone <laughs> 
as a, a friend. No, okay, that's, that sounds weird. I don't think of any brands as being my friends because they're not. They are businesses. You can be disappointed by a business and their business practice, which I think is the, the better way to approach this. Question number 11. Are there any brands that you feel give off exclusivity vibes, making you feel like you aren't cool, rich, or pretty enough to buy from? I feel like back when I first got into makeup, these were the luxury brands like Dior or YSL or Chantecaille, you know? I feel like that is 100% manufactured because they are trying to appeal to a certain demographic. Um, and they show that heavily with their shade ranges and with their products. Um, so I really, I personally, now that I've got years of makeup, you know, knowledge, experience and fun behind me, I don't feel intimidated by any brands now. If anything, I feel more informed and knowledgeable to approach these brands and be like, okay, so you're selling this lipstick for 60 bucks, but it's not that great. I've tried another lipstick for $15 or $10 and it was better than yours. What else you got to offer? If anything, I feel like everyone should be informed. And with YouTube and with everything that we have now, it's easier than ever to see reviews of these higher end brands or these luxury brands and see whether or not they're actually worth it. Because I, w I have to say most of the time there are some, there are some <laughs> pricey products that are 100% worth it that I adore and that I love. But a lot of them just aren't there. They're not cutting it. Question number 12 is, what is worse, choice fatigue, exhaustion from too many makeup releases, or a lackluster quarterly launch from a brand you're typically excited about? I would say in this day and age, a choice fatigue, brands are just throwing anything to see what sticks. I would rather see quarterly releases that have thought, that have time, that have energy put into them, than something every other week just to see what sticks. That's just how I feel. I feel like we would see a lot more creative, a lot more different things come out if people actually, and if companies actually had the time and the space to put into each release. Question number 13 is, have brand trips or sponsored videos ever made you actually interested in a product or beauty launch the brand was promoting? Okay, so I will say brand trips Never. I've never seen a brand trip video that made me want to try the product because they're clearly overcompensating for the product. Like I think they didn't benefit do a whole brand trip for their mascara that came out a while ago. Like that was over the top. And so I thought, oh, they're clearly overcompensating for a mascara. And that was like literally the only product they came out with. There have been a couple of sponsored videos that have made me buy products, but I've noticed none of them are makeup. They're all either body care or hair care. I can specifically remember there were a few sponsored videos about the new Head & Shoulders um, hair care line, the Royal Oils collection, that got me to buy the Royal Oils collection. And I love most of those products. I use them constantly and my hair has been better for it. But I've noticed that with makeup, I'm very critical now about anything sponsored. So I, I can't remember the last time or if any time a sponsored makeup video got me to buy the product just because I'm very critical. Maybe it's because of my unique position where I'm still kind of like an every av like average everyday person who works nine to five, but I've tried a lot of makeup to kind of know, like to get my foot in the door and understand like what I'm looking for, what I expect from makeup so I can be more informed to make these decisions. Yeah, <laughs> I hope that got my point across. Question number 14 is, are there any makeup brands you hope to see sold at Ulta or Sephora in the future? Honestly, I think indie brands, I know Melt is doing great in Sephora right now, but personally, I would like to see more indie brands in Ulta. I think Ulta fits them more. I think their rewards program is better. I think their store is just better suited to those kind of companies. Personally, oh, I would die to see Lunatic Cosmetic Labs in Ulta. Just, could you imagine what their bay would look like? Ah. Mm, mm, mm. I'm getting too excited. I, I think that's the one brand. I would love to see Lunatic Cosmetic Labs and maybe Besame Cosmetics in more stores. Because the only place I can actually see Besame in person, there's like this one store down the shore. I'm in Jersey, so there's a place on the Jersey Shore. I think it's in Asbury Park, maybe. 
It's like a retro dress shop, and they also have an entire counter of Besame Cosmetics. So that's like the only place that I know that I can find it. So I'd like to see Besame and Lunatic Cosmetic Labs in more stores. For my own selfish reasons. And our last question, question number 15, is if you could give any beauty brand a rebranding, which brand would it be and what elements of the brand would you modify? Am I about to get a little bit salty? Yes, I am. ABH. I would take Anastasia and Norvina out. <laughs> Just remove them from the brand, like have them retire and move on. And then we would take a look at the release schedule. We would slow that shit down and look at the collaborations. Because I think they have some really strong collabs when they put thought and time behind them and then give them enough time to actually sell. They have an amazing eyeshadow formula. They do. I love every single ABH palette that I have. I would want to look at keeping their prestige or trying to rebuild their prestige if we could and come out with new and different palettes. Specifically, I would die for a green ABH palette. Like they're a traditional 12 pan, like think modern renaissance, but greens. I would die, like I want it, <laughs> I want it. Like think subculture, but even throw more green into it, just do it. <laughs> so, I mean, I've got notes, I've got thoughts. If ABH wants to reach out, they're not gonna reach out, but like I, I have thoughts. And I really think ABH could do well from a rebranding, especially now, before things get even worse for them. Because I know everyone's been talking about how, like, downhill they've gone in the last year. And they're right. Like, they really have just changed dramatically and not in a good way. So that's it. Oh, we finally did it. So that is every question in the beauty brand tag. Thank you so much to Tara Brooke for creating this tag. I had a lot of fun. I hope you guys did too. Let me know down below what you thought about any of these brands, any of these questions, and I cannot wait to see you in my next video. Bye.